Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. That guy in the previous video is a little long-winded. <laughs> Just wait, right? We really are glad that you're here. We're in part two of a series called Jesus of the Prophets, looking uh, through the eyes of the Old Testament prophets, strange, unusual characters that God used to point forward in hope to what he would do in Jesus Christ. So we're trying to go back and look through their eyes and see what it was they longed for and hoped for and how that was fulfilled in Jesus and how he still fulfills our hopes and longings today. Let me ask you a question um, as we start this, this part of the series. What is the greatest love story ever told? The greatest love story in, the, in human history. Take a guess. What's your, what's, what's your guess? The greatest love story of all time. Romeo and Juliet, somebody said. I heard that. That's got to be in top five, right? So it's repeated and remade so many times. Romeo and Juliet, certainly. Uh, I, just, I couldn't bring myself to put Leonardo DiCaprio's face on there, so I chose an old painting, you know. Somebody else I heard say this one, Princess Bride. I mean, you don't think of it that way because we love the man in black and we love uh, and, uh, Andre the Giant, but it's, it's Wesley and Princess Buttercup. Great, great romance. I'll put this one up here because it's absolutely not the greatest love story ever told, the Titanic. She's a terrible person. She, she let him drown. And then she threw like the most valuable gem in the world in the ocean. How wasteful is that? Anyway, so that should not be on your list. Or, or, or maybe the second half of the notebook could be included. I don't like the first half so much, but the second half is very tender when he reads to her and she remembers who she is for a brief period of time. This is one of my favorite love stories, which I'm guessing is not on your list. It's the story of Baron and Luthien. Anybody know this story? This is... J.R. Tolkien wrote this story, and I know I'm going to geek out here for a minute, but behind the Lord of the Rings legends, so not the, the Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings trilogy, if you read the Silmarillion, which is the legends that make up Middle Earth that Tolkien wrote, the central love story in those legends is the story of Baron and Luthien. I know some of you are like, move on, Pastor. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> but Tolkien, Tolkien called himself Baron and his wife his Luthien. This, this great mythic love story between these two people from Middle Earth and on their gravestone, he had made sure it was printed, Baron and Luthien. I think that's very, very cool. Or maybe we have to say one of the greatest stories of all time is this story, Shrek. <laughs> Can I tell you, that's not my wedding picture. Somebody joked about that. <laughs> Aaron looks nothing like that. <laughs> So when I, years ago, I led a mission trip to the south side of Chicago for high school students, and some of, the, some of the kids from the inner city said to me, you look like Strick. They couldn't say S-H, except you ain't green. That's what they said to me. <laughs> Pull some out your ear, one kid said to me. Remember when he makes a candle? Anyway, let's move on. All right. Here's the point. The world is full of great love stories. You find them in every civilization, in every culture throughout human history. Great love stories. Myths, epics, legends, poems. Songs, why is that so? Why do we have these stories of, these great stories of the power of love between a man and a woman, between two people, why? Is it possible that we have these stories because they're pointing to a great underlying human longing in all of our hearts? A memory trace of one great love story, the greatest love story. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about here the greatest love story ever told. But the place I want to take you to show you this love story, I think will surprise you and might even unsettle you a bit. It's the Old Testament prophet Hosea. Now, a um, little, little uh, public service warning. The story of Hosea has some very mature themes. There's going to be some things in this passage that we're going to read, which are going to cause you uh, at least to be shocked if you've never read it before, maybe even a little incredulous, a little put off. I'm going to ask you to suspend your incredulity and your maybe sense of being culturally offended in our day because the story is powerful and it's beautiful if you'll stay with it. The prophets are quirky and odd people and God occasionally asks them to do strange things. But what God asks Hosea to do has to be top five most bizarre things in all the Bible. I'm just going to say that at the outset. So we're going to look at this story. What was it Hosea was learning what God, from what God asked him to do, and how did Christ fulfill that? Okay, let's, let's turn to Hosea chapter 3, and we're going to read all of chapter 3, just five verses, and uh, we'll try to make sense of it. This is 
Hosea speaking about what God asked him to do. And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear for the Lord and to his goodness as in the latter days. So basically God says to this prophet Hosea, Hosea was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. He lived during a time of the divided kingdom. He was a prophet primarily in the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel as a nation was divided into two halves, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. And things were disintegrating into chaos, financial, political, social corruption, and moral and religious decay. Um, Hosea lived during the time of arguably the worst king in the history of the southern kingdom, Judah, Jeroboam II, a very bad and wicked guy. And God says to Hosea, I want you to go and live as, with, as husband and wife, choose for, as a wife, a woman who will not be faithful to you. Because I live in love with the people of Israel who are unfaithful to me. Now, this idea of God as the groom, bridegroom or husband, and his people as the bride is a little bit foreign to us, but it's, it's pervasive throughout the Old Testament. It's in Jeremiah 2, 3, and 4. It's in Ezekiel 16 and 17. It's in all over Isaiah. We see it repeatedly, this idea that God is like a husband to his people, his bride. Now, there's lots of images for our relationship to God, and some of them are very familiar to you, and you understand them at least to a degree. For example, shepherds and sheep, right? God is the great shepherd, and we're his sheep. Even though we're not an agrarian society, you kind of get that, don't you? You're, you're dumb, poor sheep, and you need your shepherd to care for you, to guide you, to feed you, and to make sure you don't w- walk off the cliff. And, or, or kings and subjects. We're not a monarchy, but we understand this, you know? that there's a king and a ruler and we're his subjects and we're to surrender our lives and serve under his rule and reign, we sort of get that. Or certainly father and children, that he's our heavenly father and we're his children adopted into his family by his grace. And even if you had a bad earthly father, even your desire for it to be better points to a longing for a perfect father, we understand that. But I think what God is saying to Hosea and to us is, you don't really understand my love if you only know me as king, shepherd, and father. You need also to understand me as husband. Think about that for a minute. Particularly for guys, that's a hard one. Do you know God's love as spousal love? He's saying there's something missing in your understanding of how much I love you if you don't get this picture. You cannot fully understand it. Isaiah chapter 54, verses 5 and 6, we're told that your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Isaiah 62, verse 5, as the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. These are just two examples of dozens and dozens of times where God refers to himself as the bridegroom, as the husband. Let's talk about what this means for just a minute before we move on. First, If we're going to understand God this way, it means your relationship with God must be a priority relationship. Just let me ask you, those of you who are married, is is, is it a good way to have a healthy marriage if you think of your spouse as sort of an add-on to your already existing life? It's not a trick question. What's the answer? No. Everyone say no. No. That's not, not, if you're confused about that, let's talk later. That doesn't work, right? It's a priority relationship. Meaning I, I lay aside my desires and my identity and my, my selfish wants now, and the two become one. I don't just get to decide for myself. Remember the one time I had a little Toyota pickup truck when we first got married, and my wife bought a new couch without talking to me, and, and, and she was driving my truck because her car was broken, and she showed up in the driveway with a couch. I was like, what? I, what? I couldn't even buy like, lunch last week because you said so, and you bought a couch, you know? Sometimes in, with couples in premarital counseling, I'll ask them to, to write down on the card, how much is okay to spend with, without checking with your spouse first? Write on the card, don't show it to each other, and then turn it over on the count of three. One, one time, I'm not making this up, this couple, she wrote down $25, he wrote down five grand. 
<laughs> I'm like, okay, we have some talking to do, right? Coming from different perspectives, right? But you can't just, my point is, it's a priority now what the other person thinks and feels and needs. Take that in your relationship with God. Is God a priority? Or is he an add-on to your already existing life? Is he a priority relationship? Second thing, it's a relationship of intimacy. The Hebrew word to know is the word yada. And it doesn't mean intellectual knowledge only. It means intimate personal knowledge. Like Adam knew his wife. Like the Lord knows Yada, his people. It's intimate relationship. It's a relationship of intimacy to have God as your God. To have him know you in a way no one else does. You can hide things from your boss, from your parents, from your kids, from your friends, in ways you cannot hide them from your spouse. Isn't that true? Because they know you in ways you don't even know yourself sometimes. And then lastly, this means it's a relationship of great power. Because of its priority and intimacy, it's a relationship of great power. Let me give you an example from my own life. When one of you says to me something like, Pastor, you're, you're so kind and you did a great job, I, I appreciate that. But part of me thinks, well, I might have fooled you. You don't know me all that well. Because we don't have that, the intimacy. But when my wife says that I'm kind, that I'm gracious, that I did a good job. It almost doesn't matter to me what, what, what anybody else says. Because of the priority and the intimacy, there's a power that we have to bless each other. Think about that in relationship with God now. Is the most important voice in your heart God's voice? What he says about you? If it is, it almost doesn't matter what anybody else says. Husbands, if, you, if, you, if a husband tells his wife she's beautiful... And everyone else tells her she's ugly. She thinks she's beautiful. But if a husband doesn't tell her that and everybody else says that she's beautiful, she thinks she's ugly. We have, my point is, in saying to Hosea, this is what I'm like, he's saying to you and I, your relationship with God is a relationship of priority, of intimacy, and of great power. It's supposed to be anyway. But in Hosea's case, this is not a beautiful, intimate, perfect relationship, is it? From the outset, it goes bad. And the first thing I want you to see is rejected love here. And this is also important for how God deals with his people. Rejected love. Almost immediately we see the love of Hosea is not returned by his wife, whose name, by the way, is Gomer. A very unfortunate name, as is the relationship. It's repeatedly rejected. Now, in, in Hosea 3, 1, we read these words, The Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who's loved by another man and is an adulteress. That word again is very, very important. What's he saying? He's saying, go back. She, she's the same woman you loved before. Go again and love her again. We'll come back to what that means in detail. But in chapter 1, the again refers to chapter 1. In chapter 1, God tells Hosea to take for himself a wife who is going to be unfaithful. Choose a wife who is a prostitute. Now, this is not a prescription on how young men should look for a bride. In case you're wondering about that, this is what God's told specifically to Hosea. Why? God says she's, she's going to leave you for other men. It's going to break your heart, Hosea. Why would he say marry her anyway? Two reasons, I think. Well, at least two that we'll talk about. One, and it's easy to forget this, God loves Gomer. She's a real person. And he wants to bring redemptive love into her life through Hosea. He loves her. Two, and most obvious in the text, is that he wants to teach Hosea something about his own heart for his people. Prophets, after all, are supposed to speak the heart of God to the people of God. And God is saying to Hosea, I'm going to teach you something about my heart and my love that you cannot get by reading. You cannot get in a book. You can't get by, an, by just a lesson. You have to live it. You have to have your heart broken. You have to go through some pain and rejection and betrayal so that I can teach you how much I love. I don't know if this is true for you. I would guess for many of you it might be. For me, some of the most loving and gracious people I know who love God deeply and who love others well are people who have been through some stuff, been through some pain. Is that true for you? 
You get to know them, and you find that you're attracted to them because they have this depth and warmth of relationship with God and others, and you find out they've been through some pain. And it hasn't hardened them, it's softened them. It's made them more gracious. I think God is saying to Hosea, I want you to see my heart, and this is the way I'm going to show you. You're going to feel what it's like to be betrayed and have your heart broken. This is what a prophet does, speak the heart of God to the people of God. So Hosea marries Gomer, and she bears three children. We don't have time to get into all of this. Two sons and a daughter, a daughter in the middle, and the youngest son, just to give you an example of how dysfunctional this marriage is, the youngest son, uh, Hosea, names Lo-Ami, which in Hebrew means not mine. You can do the math. It gets worse. Gomer goes from one man to another man to another man after she leaves him. Her own children in chapter 2 and in chapter 5 plead with her to come home, but she refuses. And it, she just, she's like all the markings of someone in the throes of an addiction. She just can't even control herself. Until we find out in chapter 3 that she's, she ends up on the streets for sale. Now there's a lot of talk these days about the, the horrors of human trafficking. This is not a new evil in the world. We don't know exactly how Gomer ended up there. Perhaps she got herself into financial debt and she's paying it off by selling herself. More likely, she's been abused by men and now is being discarded by them and sold for whatever they could get from her as, as, as property, like a garage sale. It's a tragic story. So broken. God is saying, this is what my relationship with people is like. They run out on me. They chase after other gods. They run their lives into the ground when I offer them redeeming love. They reject me. They ignore me. They destroy their own souls when I offer them healing. And I want you to see something. Sometimes we think of God in the Old Testament as just really angry all the time. And Jesus is nice. But God in the Old Testament is sort of grumpy about sin. No doubt God hates sin. But this picture of God and his love is different. It shows you that God doesn't just hate sin, he's heartbroken over it. Do you ever think of God not just as angry, but as heartbroken? Agonizing? Desperately longing for the people that he loves to return to him? Not just mad, but sad? Listen to God's heart in these selected passages from Jeremiah, uh, from chapter 2, 3, and 4. I just want you to hear God's heart. This is put piece together from the prophet. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, says the Lord. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Keep your feet from going unshod and your throat from thirst, but you said, it is hopeless, for I have loved foreigners, and after them I will go. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. If a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? Would not that land be greatly polluted? You have played the whore with many lovers, and would you return to me, declares the Lord? And then how, listen how tender verse 30 of chapter 4 is. And you, O desolate one, what do you mean that you dress in scarlet, you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, that you enlarge your eyes with paint? In vain you beautify yourself. Your lovers despise you, they seek your life. That last phrase is really profound, but it's easy to miss. He's saying to his people then and now, he's saying to us, your false loves, your lovers despise you. What does he mean? The gods you try to put in my place do not love you. They will not save you. They do not feed your soul. They, they demand your life from you and give you nothing in return. Why do you go after them? Why do you chase them? He means the false gods of our culture too, not just the idols in ancient Israel. Gods of career success. Gods of wealth and status. Gods of children's success. Gods of your family's reputation. You might be thinking, well, that's a good thing to love my family. Yes, it is. But if you try to get from your children's success and your family's reputation what only the love of God is meant to give you, it'll wreck your soul, and it might wreck your family. They can't give you that. They despise you in that sense. They demand things from you that only God wants to give you. 
it's really a profoundly moving picture. So what does God do about this? About people that run out on him? Well, let's look at what he does with Hosea. This is pursuing love. God pursues in his love. God tells Hosea to go get her. Go out and search for her. Your bride, find her, bring her home. This is the relentless pursuit of the offender by the offended. This is central to the gospel. The relentless pursuit of the one who's offended. I'm, the, the, you've hurt me, God says, and yet I chase you. You ever see the movie Beautiful Boy with Steve Carell or heard about it? It's about a father whose son has deepened a meth addiction and his desperate love for him. I was doing a little reading about that movie and I came across another story. A story of a dad who's, who found out that his daughter was on the streets of Denver and she was a heroin addict. And she would not come home. And he had tracked her on her cell phone before the service was cut off and he knew where she was. And he was, all the efforts to save her were, came to nothing. And he was so crushed he thought, how can I just stay here and live my life and go to work and when my daughter is on the streets? So he moved to Denver, and since she would not come home, he lived for a year on the streets with her to bring her home, pursuing her. I remember sitting with a family from our church years and years ago whose daughter was a heroin addict as well, an intervention, pleading with her to get in the van and go to treatment. She was shooting the drug between her toes so the parents wouldn't see the, the tracks. It was just one of the saddest, most desperate moments. And I wish I could tell you that one all worked out great. It didn't. God pursues. He tells Hosea, I know your heart's been broken. I know she doesn't technically deserve it. I know you have every right to say, enough is enough already. She's made her choice but go get her, go find her, go bring her home. Where does Hosea have to go to find Gomer who's on the streets? He's gotta to go to the red light district. He's gotta go where prophets of God aren't supposed to go to find her. Because she won't come home. He has every right to cast her aside. Now, let me just pause here and say something. This, again, is not a prescription. For, for those of you who perhaps have been or are in a relationship where you f are being abused, and I know that goes on, or you have been uh, mistreated and marginalized and been unfaithful to, for, God is not saying that you always have to subject yourself to that. He's teaching Hosea about his love. It's about his love. It's not a prescription for how to behave in, a, in every marriage. God's heart is that he goes and finds us. We often think about man as pursuing God, right? We talk about this. We pursue intellectual pursuit, emotional pursuit, spiritual pursuit for truth, for God. But the Bible's primary picture is not that God is playing coy or making it hard for us and we're chasing him, but that we run from him and he pursues us. That's the actual picture of, of the human condition, is that God is in pursuit of you. Have you ever felt the loving pursuit of God in your life? Have you ever felt that he's after you? Maybe it unsettles you. Maybe you run, have run from him for a while. I talked to a man last night after our service who said, I have been running from God for the last 20 years. This is my first Sunday back in church, first Saturday back in church. I didn't know that man. I didn't, he didn't know I was going to preach on Hosea, but God did. It's part of his pursuit. 2 Timothy chapter 2 well, let's look at from Hosea chapter 2. Uh, we'll see a little bit of God's heart here in verses 14 and 15. This is what God wants, what he longs for, for Israel and for us. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, his bride, he means, and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her the vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. The valley of Achor is a story where some terrible things happen in the Old Testament. And God says, I'm going to make it a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the same time when she came out of the land of Egypt. In verse 19, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Yada, the Lord. God's pursuing because that's who he is. 
2 Timothy 2, verse 13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Simply put, God is not pursuing you because you're awesome. He's not pursuing me because I'm so lovely and worth it. It's because of who he is. He cannot deny himself. And what I mean is this. If you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ and given your life to him, then he will never stop running you down. He will never stop chasing you. You cannot get away from his love. Romans chapter 8, right? I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the key phrase, in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, he has you. Meaning, in John 10, Jesus says, all the Father has given me, no one will snatch them out of my hand. I like to put it this way. Your salvation does not depend on the strength of your grip on God but the strength of his grip on you. And nobody can break his grip. But if you're in Christ, if you're not in Christ, if you haven't surrendered to him, if you've never made that decision, he chases you too, so that you will come to know how much he loves you. So what does this mean? It means you cannot run him, and he'll never give up on you. Let's look back at Hosea for a minute. Verse 3, well, let's, this brings us to the, the, the last point I'll make first, redeeming love. So it's, it's, a, it's a rejected love, it's a pursuing love, and it's a redeeming love. The whole story comes down to this question. How is it possible that Hosea could bring Gomer back and, and, and it be okay again? I mean, just think for a minute about the emotional, psychological, and spiritual pain that she has caused, that her decisions have caused. How, how are you going to get over that? How are you going to bring her back and, and trust her again? How are you going to have this relationship that you longed for, that she destroyed? The whole story comes down to this question. Let's look at two, verse 2 and 3 again of Hosea chapter 3. It's, it's said so matter-of-factly here that you can miss the significance of it. Verse 2, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. A homer and a lethic is a homer and a half. A lethic is a half a homer, in case you're wondering. <laughs> this is about the standard price for a slave in that culture. That's what it's come to. She sold for the price of a slave. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. That's a difficult verse to translate. What he's saying is very tender here. He's saying, I'm going to buy you back. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And when you come home, we're not going to pretend like nothing happened. There's going to be a time of healing and restoration where you'll live with me and I'll live with you and we'll be strangers in the same house and slowly we'll be reconciled to each other so that you can be mine and I can be yours again. I'm not going to pretend like this didn't happen. You need to be healed and so do I. But it starts with what? So he bought her. He bought her. The fundamental principle here from the gospel is that there's a price to be paid for redeeming love. Redeeming love is not free. It costs. And it doesn't just cost the financial price, which Hosea paid. He's also, think about it, paying the emotional price of putting his heart out there again, right? There's a cost emotionally to him. He's paying the social, cultural price of, this is the prophet of God. Don't you think his friends are going, that's a bad idea. Why are you bringing her back? You should never have married her in the first place. I could have told you that was going to go south. Didn't you know where, what she was like? He's bringing her back. In every way, Hosea absorbs the cost. Why? To redeem her. I hope you see where this is going. God pursues you because you run from him. Friends, who are you in this story? Who are you? You don't want to say it. I'll tell you. You're Gomer. I'm Gomer. Just let that sink in for a minute. You are the unfaithful spouse. You are the one who rejects the one who made you and loves you and runs after false gods and gives your heart to them, (laughs) breaking the heart of the one who loves you and made you over and over again. And there's a cost for his pursuit 
and his redemption, it is not free. It's free to you, but it costs him everything. It costs him everything. This is the, one of the most beautiful pictures. James Boyce said that Je- Hosea chapter 3 is the greatest chapter in all the Bible. I don't know if that's true, but I'm beginning to see why he would say that. It's an incredible love story. All those stories we talked about jokingly at the beginning are pointing to this deep longing I think all of us have to be loved this way. To know that nothing we do would be beyond his forgiveness and grace. That he would always come after us and always find us and always buy us back. And the cross says he has. He absolutely has. All of this points us to God and his salvation. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, Jesus is being questioned about fasting by the disciples of John the Baptist, and he says something really fascinating. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we, the Pharisees, fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. What does he mean? Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. Remember this profound metaphor all throughout the Old Testament, not of shepherd and sheep or father and children or kings and subjects, but of bride and groom. God's love for you is a spousal love. And Jesus says, that's me. I am the one who comes and finds you in the red light district. I'm the one who chases you down when you run from me. I'm the one who pays the ultimate price to bring you home into my family. That's how much God loves you. And sometimes I think living in the comfortable Chicagoland suburbs and being in church for a long time, first like many of us, can make you forget that. You forget. You forget you're Gomer, I'm Gomer. And God loves us this way. This is the greatest love story in the world. And it has power to transform lives. Yours and mine. Look at verse 9 of the very last chapter of Hosea, and then we'll wrap up here. At the end of this great uh, prophet's book, um, he says this, Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, the upright walk in them, but the transgressors stumble in them. What's he saying? I think what God is saying through the prophet, this is not just a story for ancient Israel. It's not just a story about what happened once upon a time in, in the history of the Old Testament. It's a story for you today. L- listen to them, this story. Trust the God of this story. Know that he loves you this way. Walk in his love, Hosea says. A couple of short applications and then we'll pray. First, again, this is not a prescription for ev- that you have to stay in a relationship. If you're, if you're in a situation where you've been, your wife is, or husband has been unfaithful or abusive, this is not, does not mean you have to try to be Hosea in your own strength. But it does mean this. It does mean never, ever give up on what God could do. Not what you could do or what you have to do, but what God could do. If this story tells you anything, it tells you nobody is beyond the reach of the amazing love of God. It may take, I talked to somebody else just last night who said I've been praying 20 years. And this sermon reminded me not not to stop. I'd almost given up. Don't give up praying and believing that God could reach someone. And last, I've said it before a couple of times, I'll say it again. Friends, you're Gomer. In what way are you and I rejecting the love of God? In what way are you running from him? Perhaps you know what that feels like. Perhaps you're doing it right now. Do you know that he pursues you? Do you know how much he loves you? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the way that you love us. We don't like to think of ourselves this way, and it's hard for us to get our minds around this, but we are unfaithful. And our rejection and rebellion has broken your heart. Oh God, that would break our heart too. And that we would turn back to you, you who are gracious and forgiving and loving, that you and your mercy would restore us because that's how you love us, through Jesus, the true bridegroom. We pray this in his name. Amen. 